Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you tonight and to introduce to you Father Stephen Fields, who will speak to us on the future of liberalism, relativism, and fronts St. Augustine. Now, we've had quite a few events discussing the fate of liberalism here on campus recently, including a talk uh, given in February by Notre Dame's Patrick Deneen on why liberalism failed, uh, his most recent book. And then there was also a lecture a few weeks ago, some of you might have been there, um, by Charles Taylor on democratic degeneration. So I imagine such a thick slate of programming on this top ind indicates a growing awareness in the academy of the uniqueness of our historical moment and the challenges and mutations um, that liberalism is presently experiencing are likely not just blips on the radar, but uh, demand renewed and serious interdisciplinary attention. With the discipline of theology, of course, taking center stage tonight. And in that respect, I'd like to thank uh, the Theology Club at the Divinity School for co-sponsoring uh, this talk. So Father Fields is Associate Professor of the Philosophy of Religion and Systematic Theology at Georgetown University and a member of the Society of Jesus. Holding degrees from Oxford and Yale, he is the author of Being a Symbol, on the origins and development of Karl Wanner's metaphysics, and more recently, Analogies and Transcendence, an essay on nature, grace, and modernity, as well as the editor of a collection of essays on uh, Pope Benedict XVI's thought, published just last year. Otherwise, his research and writing cover a uh, variety of theological topics, including the work of Hans Urs von Balthasar, John Henry Newman, Transcendental Thomism, and Trinitarian Theology, as well as Catholicism Catholicism's relations to liberalism, uh, postmodernism, and the contemporary university. At Georgetown, Father Fields was also elected by his undergraduate students to the Dorothy M. Brown Award for Teaching, and proudly holds the liturgy for service to athletics. So please join me in warmly welcoming him now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And, uh, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Christoph, just one small correction. Please don't be too uh, annoyed with me, but I'm a full professor. <laughs> In the academy, these things make all the difference, as you know. Uh, this is my main uh, trip to uh, this is my main trip to uh, Hyde Park. My first, my maiden visit to Hyde Park. I'm a Yale man, and. Uh, I've never been here, and it's, it's a delight that Thomas, I'm so grateful to Thomas and the Lumen Christi Institute for inviting me. By liberalism, uh, we mean a system of government supporting ideas such as free and fair elections, forms of human equality like blind justice for all, civil rights like religion, speech, assembly, and private property. It is often deemed to be grounded in a social contract in which the government arises from and is responsible to those whom it governs. Its origins in the West can be traced to the republics of Athens and Rome, later to the Magna Carta of 1215, as subsequently advanced against the divine right of kings in the English Civil War of 1648, and the bloodless revolution of 1688, not to mention the American and at least the professed ideals of the French Revolution. Its theoreticians include Cicero, the barons at Runnymede, Locke, the Madison of the Federalist Papers, Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, even in their opposition, as this is engagingly laid out in Yuval Levin's 2014 book called The Great Debate. Now, as Christoph was saying, the future of liberalism as so defined is a topic much, even obsessively, ruminated upon these days in the circles that many of us travel in. Its ubiquity is diversely evinced in the pages of First Things, the monthly magazine of the Institute on Religion and Public Life, and La Civiltà Cattolica, the Jesuit edited quasi-official issue of the Holy See, in learned journals like the Catholic theological publication Communio, in the New York Times filings of David Brooks and the Washington columns Washington Post columns of George Will, and 
as Christoph also mentioned in the hot off the Yale University Press book entitled Why Liberalism Failed by the Notre Dame political theorist, my friend and former Georgetown colleague, Patrick Deneen, who has gotten me out of the ivory tower of systematic theology and into issues like this of more practical import. Now, in light of the richness of this commentary, I would like in my short time with you to entertain the following problem. Let us suppose, for the sake of argument, that reasonable people of goodwill, including many Catholics, can make a strong, even a compelling case that liberalism has become, in a significant way, morally corroded. Can we, that is, these same reasonable people of goodwill, especially us Catholics, nonetheless still make a case for our continued cooperation with liberalism? In other words, can we persevere in good conscience to pay our taxes, serve in the military, staff the civil service, vote, respect laws we might find repugnant, and otherwise bring up our children to pledge the flag allegiance and to promote the general welfare reasonably confident that as our Constitution's preamble proclaims, these efforts may secure to us the blessings of liberty and to our posterity. Now, lest at the outset you may think that I have set up a straw man by suggesting that liberalism is morally corroded, and lest you think that it is patently absurd to suggest withdrawing our cooperation from the acts of civil piety that I just mentioned, let me first put forth the argument for liberalism's compromised ethics. Let us turn, for example, to Patrick Deneen, who, as Ross Doutet says in a recent review of his book, contends that contemporary liberalism boils down to selfish individualism coupled with bureaucratic despotism. This unhappy union has delivered not equality, but government by the mercantile elite, not liberty, but appetitiveness regulated by the surveillance state, not intellectual and religious freedom, but conformity and mediocrity. It has reduced culture to consumerism and smashed social and familiar relations. On this last point, we needn't, of course, flog the dead horse by mentioning the following egregious violations of natural law now enshrined as positive law under liberal constitutional principles. The 2015 Supreme Court decision in Obergefell, which guarantees in all 50 states the right under the 14th Amendment of same-sex couples to marry on the same terms and conditions as opposite-sex couples and the 1973 decision in Roe, guaranteeing under the same amendment a woman's right to abortion in the first two trimesters. But over and above these, we might consider David Schindler's argument that the liberal state is aggressively neutral toward and thus cavalierly, cav cavalierly ignoring of the duties it owes to the chief tenant and ground of the natural law, God. Indeed, as opposed to the Declaration of Independence that declares humanity's unalienable rights to be granted by the laws of nature and nature's God, Schindler notes that contemporary liberalism operates according to a freedom of choice, willfully indifferent to nature's laws and nature's God, both of which are conveniently bracketed, so to speak, in order to allow the maximum toleration of diverse, even diametrically opposed, moral views and deeds within the same commonwealth. Indeed, Jefferson, surely no friend of the unexpurgated scriptures, 
much less of institutional religion, himself wondered whether, and I quote, the liberties of a nation can be secure when we have removed a conviction that they are the gift of God, unquote. Now, for his part, Patrick Deneen, with Alexis de Tocqueville's incisive 1840 book, Democracy in America, looking over his shoulder, reminds us that liberalism can only flourish when it is grounded in what he calls pre-liberal forces and habits. These forces constitute a nexus of unchosen obligations and allegiances. Two, for example, the communities of family and locality, to the morality and transcendence of religion. And two, and this is a beautiful turn phrase, Patrick's, to the aristocracy of art and philosophy as privileged nurturers of the human spirit. When these allegiances dry up as the seedbed of liberalism sprouting and fruition, culture enters a drought of objectivity of the true and the good, as does the social cohesion that this objectivity made possible. In turn, liberalism is forced to reground itself, and it finds, as the current debates make all too clear, that this new ground consists of a world of atomized selves looking something like the famous monads that define the cosmology of the 17th century thinker Leibniz. These monadic selves are windowless units unaffected by each other, each of which expresses the whole universe. In short, what Schindler calls freedom in pursuit of excellence, that is freedom in pursuit of the true and the good, as revealed to us by nature's laws and nature's God, this freedom becomes supplanted by a solipsism that fashions the self into the source of its own true and good, into the source, in other words, of its own moral ends, goals, and purposes. The upshot is that the order of morality is turned topsy-turvy. The objectivity of the good, revealed, as I say, in nature's laws and nature's God, is no longer the gold standard by which the right actions of human agents are measured. On the contrary, just the opposite obtains. The right assumes priority over the good. In other words, the decision about what is right and wrong made according to moral agents, free individuality becomes the gold standard for what constitutes the good. And we thus find ourselves in very short order experiencing a contemporary world that is hallmarked by moral relativism. It, in a word, constitutes the new seedbed of liberalism. Whether and to what extent liberalism can survive in this tough to plow soil, deeply replete with unyielding rocks of diverse shapes and sizes, remains an open question. Now, fully aware of liberalism's new relativist seedbed, a range of recent thinkers seeks not to launch an assault on relativism head on, as Plato and Aristotle did when in the fourth pre-Christian century they discovered the very nature of the human mind, but they endeavor to warrant and justify relativism under the rubric of what Cardinal Newman ironically called the healthy development of human reason. Prominent among these thinkers is Richard Rorty, late professor in Princeton, Virginia, and Stanford. 
although he believes quite rightly that naive forms of relativism are self-refuting, he does note that our individual moral claims do not necessarily provide other people with compelling justification to accept them. This is because there is no God's eye view of truth that exists according to which one justification can be, can be uh, claimed to be superior to another. Nonetheless, he continues, we cannot say that every coherent moral claim is as good as every other claim. We do not, for instance, have to accept that totalitarianism is as good as liberalism. Truth, says Rorty, is ethnocentric. That is, it is socially and culturally conditioned. We must, as a result, operate by what he calls our best rational lights, and from their shining deem other moral perspectives inadequate. Rorty is indebted to the pragmatism of the 19th century American philosopher and psychologist William James, which asserts truth to be what is workably productive for us in our context. Accordingly, Rorty defines truth as applicable to those beliefs we think are so well justified to us that they need no further justification for us. Well, we might speculate, based on Rorty's qualified relativism, that the role of the liberal state when enacting and adjudicating laws that touch on diversely but passionately held moral views would be to discern liberal society's criteria on the basis of its best ethnocentric ethical lights. And perhaps this is just what, in fact, the Supreme Court tried to do when it handed down Obergefell and Roe. But even if legislatures and courts could, in fact, discern these criteria correctly, they could very easily, perhaps even very probably, contravene the laws of nature and nature's God. While such a contravening would be merely illusory for the no God's eye view of truth rorty, still, many of us, might well experience an instinctive moral outrage that we would deem to be a sign of integral and authentic humanism. Moral outrage, we should recall, has often been cited, even by professedly secular ethicists, as evidence for the objectivity of at least some moral norms. In a similar vein, David Wong of Duke defines morality of a system of rules for regulating interpersonal conflict in a satisfactory way. Two people, for instance, may, respectively, tell a third person to have and not to have an abortion. Although they both manifest a real disagreement, that disagreement for Wong is merely pragmatic, not logical, because neither argument violates the principle of non-contradiction. Wong, when asked whether his position precludes moral outrage, such as we might feel when hearing about the torture for pleasure of innocent children, would respond that such an act would be immoral because it does not well regulate interpersonal conflict. <laughs> I hoped that the irony would become apparent. We might speculate that while it is surely the role of the liberal state to regulate interpersonal conflict, if this is the upper limit of the state's moral concern, then it could well serve as a warrant for favoring the strong over the weak should the body of the governed so license that as a criterion for conflict resolution. Gilbert Harmon, 
who recently retired from Princeton, holds that a given act can be right with respect to one fr set of frameworks or moral coordinates, but wrong with respect to another framework. Accordingly, nothing is absolutely right or wrong apart from the moral system within which the act is judged. When asked whether the moral frameworks as such can be assessed among themselves as better or worse, Harmon responds that because physics demonstrates reality to be relative, it follows that morality is likely relative too. Indeed, because moral relativity is an empirical fact of humanity, it is due, he argues, not to false thinking, but to the limits of thinking. Thus, when people engage in moral disagreement, however strongly, they are merely projecting their subjective absolutism onto a relativist world recalcitrant recalcitrantly so conditioned. It is fair to say, claims Harmon, that some moral frameworks that would, for instance, license the pleasure, the torture for pleasure of children, are not successful. The challenge that follows from this lack of success is for others to persuade the torturer of his framework's inadequacy by arguing from within his own framework to show the preference of other frameworks that disallow the act. One critic, not me, but one critic has argued that Harmon's ethics denies to a person a compelling reason to do what he or she deems in conviction to be morally required. If this is the case, then one wonders whether Harmon does not obviate the integrity and honor of conscience as well as of human heroism altogether. A liberal state that no longer inspires these values will, it seems to me, implode under the lethargic weight of moral sloth. As Edmund Burke wrote in Present Discontents, and I quote, when bad men combined to perpetuate the subtle designs and united cabals of ambitious citizens. The good must associate. If the virtuous do not arise to action, all will fall one by one, an unpitied sacrifice in a contemptible struggle." End quote. Now, perhaps the most compelling defense of the relativism of contemporary liberalism has been developed by the late John Rawls of Harvard. As noted by Michael Sandel, currently himself a Harvard political theorist, Rawls precipitated an intellectual revolution by his 1971 classic book, A Theory of Justice. It displaced the dominant view of Anglo-American political philosophy that human rights are based on utilitarianism's rule of the greatest good for the greatest number. By contrast, Rawls, while positing a voluntarist view of the human person, nonetheless firmly fixes the universal rationality of justice. As Rawls writes, I quote, the desire to express our nature as a free and equal rational being can be fulfilled only by acting on the principles of right and justice as having first priority. It is acting from this precedence that expresses our freedom from utilitarian contingency and happenstance. Therefore, in order to realize our nature, we have no alternative but to plan to preserve our sense of justice as governing our other 
aims. End quote. Still, however admirable and moving this passage is, it is nonetheless important to note that Rawls is not specifying a notion of justice grounded on the priority of the good over the right. To do so would be to posit a teleological ethics in which the free choice of moral agents in order to be ethical ought to accord with some heteronomously given end, goal, telos, or purpose, such as nature's laws and nature's God. Rawls's universal, universal notion, notion of justice is deontological in that it maintains the priority of the right over the good. Although we as rational agents have a duty to assign justice priority over all our other aims, still how we do this is essentially a matter for the autonomous individual self, precisely as a free rational agent, to determine without compulsion. The overriding rule to act justly is therefore like the categorical imperative of Kant's second critique that constitutes its background. It is formal. Its content is detached from our reflections about the nature of the good life and the highest human ends, such as God. Now, it is precisely this tension between the formal rational imperative of justice and the diversity of its applications by free moral agents that subsequently concerns Rawls more deeply in his 1993 book entitled Political Liberalism. This tension creates a fundamental problem for contemporary liberalism. On the one hand, the demands of peace and civil order require sufficient consensus about what is right to exist within civil society so that civil society can continue to ratify its forms of government, which, as we have seen, must, according to liberal theory, arise from and be accountable to the people. On the other hand, the people in modern democratic societies do not embody a consensus about what is right and just because they disagree about the nature of the good and the true. How then, asks Rawls, can we negotiate between the need for enough consensus to establish public order and the need to allow the broadest latitude of toleration for individual selves to be the sources of their own conceptions of the true and the good. He puts the answer forth in his influential theory called the overlapping consensus. The heart of this theory lies in its laying out the criteria for civil debate based on a concept of what is publicly reasonable. As we have seen in liberal societies, people holding diverse and conflicting moral, philosophical, and religious views enter into a social contract that while providing for order and peace, guarantees individual rights that government is bound to safeguard. For Rawls, however, Precisely because of this social contract, individuals should be required to bracket, that means to, to suspend for the purposes of public debate, to bracket their moral, philosophical, and religious views and confine civic debate to those other reasons that remain apart from the bracketing. The requirements of justice that emerge from this post-bracketed discourse hearken to Rawls's notion of the veil of ignorance 
which he developed in a theory of justice. This metaphor, the veil of ignorance, entails a theory indicating how the principles of pure justice can be established without the undue influence of any personal bias. As the theory goes, these pure principles of justice will properly come to the fore when people freely associate in a situation of equality in which every individual remains in temporary ignorance of his own, his and her own race, class, gender, religion, aims, and attachments. So too, in the overlapping consensus, citizens should, for the political purposes of civic discussion, think of themselves as free, independent, and unclaimed by any prior duties and obligations to final ends given by conceptions of the good and the true. It will be immediately evident, ladies and gentlemen, that the overlapping consensus is the direct opposite of Patrick Deneen's claim, based on Tocqueville, that pre-liberal duties and obligations are precisely what conduces to liberalism's thriving, and that without their vigorous public exercise in civil society, liberalism fails. Still, Rawls, for his part, is not, as he states, seeking a mere modus vivendi for liberalism akin to Rorty's pragmatism. He does admit that some notion or notions of the good and the true may, in fact, be real, even though for the purposes of the social contract, a civic enshrinement of these is not feasible. He also admits that for private purposes, all citizens should enjoy unencumbered freedom to adhere to their pre-political duties and obligations to the good and the true as their convictions dictate. The dualism between the private self and the public self entailed in the overlapping consensus obtains only for the maintenance of the social contract in the midst of moral, philosophical, and religious fracturing of contemporary society. In fact, contends Rawls, this dualism should assist citizens to develop a whole series of public virtues, such as cooperation, mutual toleration, meeting others halfway, a sense of fairness, all of which will be conducive to the maintenance of the social contract and thus redound to the benefit of all. Let us consider two further criticisms of Rawls in addition to Patrick Deneen's. The first is the trenchant criticism of Sandel of Harvard which calls into question the fundamental premise of the overlapping consensus, which is its neutrality toward the good and consequently its priority of the right over the good. Incisively, Sandel returns us to the celebrated election debate of 1858 between Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln about what should be the nation's policy on slavery. For his part, Douglas develops what Sandel calls the most famous case in American history for bracketing a controversial moral question for the sake of political disagreement. Douglas argued that federal policy should be neutral to the good or the evil of slavery. Accordingly, the federal policy should allow local governments to decide the matter, thus and thus reduce the risk of destroying the civil peace and concord of the states joined in a liberal union. To this position, 
Lincoln applied his razor-sharp rebuttal saying, and I quote, any man can advocate political neutrality who does not see anything wrong in slavery, but no man can logically say it who sees a wrong in it, because no man can logically say he don't care whether a wrong is voted up or down. If it is wrong, he cannot say people have a right to do wrong." End quote. Lincoln's rejoinder may remind us Catholics of an age of Cardinal Ottaviani's famous retort to the draft of the Second Vatican Council's decree on religious liberty. Error has no rights. Now, as Lincoln's words are applied to the overlapping consensus, it seems to follow that there is no escaping the priority of the good over the right. In other words, neutrality toward the good is an incoherent position. Dare we recall that the decisive way the matter of slavery was settled came at the cost of 850,000 lives as a recent study estimates. Sandel contends that this same nexus of morality and politics that came together in the slavery question also comes together in our own pressing questions of abortion and same-sex marriage. The force of Sandel's analysis compellingly leads us to ask whether it is not preferable to the risk of civil strife to allow, even encourage, our moral, religious, and philosophical views to enter freely into civil debate rather than to sequester them from public reason. We might recall that Pope Benedict, when he addressed the leaders of British society in Westminster Hall in September of 2010, advocated just such an expanded model of public dis discourse. Now, in his own critique of Rawls, David Schindler focuses his eye on the state's implicit canonization of the right's priority over the good. He highlights the patent irony in the state's use of this principle, that is the right's priority over the good, to protect, as it were, the liberal virtue of toleration. In fact, Schindler argues, prioritizing the right over the good runs the risk of eliminating the distinction between the state on the one hand and civil society on the other hand. This distinction is vital to liberalism because it maintains civil society, that is the people, as the locus of the state's legitimacy, even as it preserves the accountability of the state's behavior to the people. When this healthy tension between state and society is relaxed, the state easily tends toward what Schindler, quoting Joseph Ratzinger, calls a dictatorship of relativism. In other words, the state in claiming to allow maximum leeway for individually decided rights, makes a choice without any meaningful public debate to impose a notion of the good and the true on civil society. This imposed notion of the good and the true is becoming all too often decided by authoritarian, bureaucratic, or judicial fiat. By this imposition, the state suborns the voice of the people into its own prerogatives, thus aggrandizing itself into a form of moral leviathan. Schindler sees this dictatorship implicitly at work in the last federal administration's threat to compel Catholic institutions 
to provide contraception to all their employees, even though such institutions consider this act to constitute moral cooperation with evil. Such a threat of the state against the consciences of otherwise law-abiding persons responsible for the policies of these institutions could, of course, be revived at any time. Now, my own responses to the trenchant criticisms of Sandel and Schindler would emphasize that although they make clear the ironies latent in the state's neutrality toward the good and its favoring of the right over the good, they are, alas, less helpful in, propo in proposing how to reconcile the ironic discrepancies. For his part, Sandel would have our moral, philosophical, and religious views more amply feed an undernourished public discourse. While this is certainly a clear desideratum, still Patrick Deneen does make a case for the significant diminution of the role of religion and other pre-liberal forces in civil society, even if they have not evanesced outright. Although Deneen's critics may well have a point when they affirm that liberalism, although wounded, nonetheless has the innate power to regenerate itself, still the wound, even if not mortal, appears deep and handicapping. Accordingly, even if Rawls's bracketed aims and attachments are freed from their privately sequestered cage, we might well wonder whether they be robust enough to counter the principle seemingly endemic now in liberal society, that the self is the source of its own ends. Will they be able, in other words, to shift the public tide from Rawls's notion of justice, even as Rawls shifted the tide from utilitarianism? For his part, David Schindler seems to propose a more radical solution that, in my opinion, would replace one form of authoritarianism with another. He would not be content, for instance, with Schindler's prescription that our moral, philosophical, and religious views should be driven full throttle into public discourse. He believes that doing so simply would delay the question of the normativity of the good and the true. In other words, Schindler seems to find it problematic that in liberalism, given the weakening of Tocqueville's pre-liberal forces, those who believe that the source of the good and the true lie in the laws of nature and nature's God are now compelled to persuade their fellow citizens to accept this view. The fact that such persuasion is needed seems, in Schindler's view, tantamount to material cooperation with evil. And he does, in fact, advocate that a sense of divine obligation should somehow be incorporated into the functioning of freedom in civil society. Although he does not push this obligation into an outright call for a theocracy, he does seem to want to jettison liberalism for something akin to a theocracy. But would this not simply be another form of dictatorship that history, looking at Calvin's Geneva, among other instances, has deemed a failure? We are thus brought to confront again the question that I posed at the beginning. If liberalism's social contract, even in light of the gravity of its defects, likely remains the only steady course to steer between anarchy on the one hand and authoritarianism on the other hand, <clears throat> 
even as it carries the precious cargo of toleration, then what moral attitude should reasonable people like us Catholics take toward liberalism, given that they, well, we, view the laws of nature and nature's God to be the source of the true and the good. In his great work, The City of God. Saint Augustine, the late fourth, early fifth century father of the church, surveyed the moral condition of the Roman Empire. It stood, he observes, honored among the nations, proud in the imposition of its rule, and renowned in its literary and engineering feats. And yet, because its fundamental motives were invidious, the good that the Romans achieved nonetheless withered by a poison flowing from the root. Quoting Sallust, he says, greedy of praise, prodigal of wealth, desirous of great glory, they worshipped false gods and sacrificed victims to demons. For these reasons, God in his providence, Augustine says, quoting scripture, allowed Rome to have received its reward. Already in decay by the barbarian sieges, even as the father of the West was writing, the Imperium's praise, wealth, and glory were purely temporal, finally evanescing after what would have seemed to be a perpetual hegemony. Given that the Roman state systematically subordinated honest virtue to the service of its own vanity, what vestiges of good, Augustine leads us to ask, remained, if any, to justify the Christians' loyal cooperation? Now, in answering, Augustine reminds us that all legitimate authority comes from God, as mediated through the natural law. Among its major premises, the natural law demonstrates that human beings are necessarily social. St. Thomas Aquinas concurs with Augustine, designating sociality as an inclination entailed in humanity's very essence as rational. Furthermore, as social, human beings require some form of governing authority in order to regulate their cohesion. Such authority begins within the family and then extends, according to the principle of subsidiarity, to ever-widening groups, to clans, towns, provinces, nation-states, and even international structures. The primary obligation of all government under the natural law is to guarantee order and peace among the governed precisely because the more advanced forms of, of the common good cannot otherwise be achieved. It therefore follows that any government which provides order and peace is acting in a basic sense according to the law of nature and hence according to the law of nature's God. As such, it has a claim on our moral cooperation however otherwise its failings might be. Indeed, says Augustine, God can never be believed to have left the kingdoms of men, their dominions and servitudes, outside the laws of his providence. Moreover, Augustine realizes that Christians themselves, although incorporated into the church that mediates grace to them through the sacraments, are nonetheless still prone to the corruption of sin, 
Thus they can contribute to the degeneration of society even as they possess within themselves the grace to reform themselves. And so through their sanctified efforts to help reform both society and state. For Augustine, then, God is to be found most immediately not in the state, but in the redeemed aspects ecclesially mediated of our own individual hearts. Here is where the life of faith, hope, and love the most authentic marks of God live and thrive. In making this claim, Augustine is still affirming that the state's work for peace and order, fun functioning outside the grace of the church, truly mediates the same God, who has not only in Christ endowed the world with grace, but who has, in the first place, created the world from nothing out of his own infinite intelligence and freedom. However flawed creation may have become, still the vestiges of its divine creator remain in it. Even as the image of God remains, however dimmed in the human person. Several corollaries follow from this argument of Augustine. First, in Fields's opinion, Christians should have markedly reduced expectations of what a civil government can and will provide. If it provides basic peace and order, it merits our cooperation. Its corruption should realistically be expected, given the range of concupiscence that afflicts human persons, like the base pleasure ensuing from doing things that are forbidden. I assume Augustine to mean that Christians should expect that the state will violate not only Christian virtue, but even the natural law. As we know from the Roman martyrology, the Pax Romana, however beneficial it was for trade and global communication, suffered from a dearth of religious freedom and a savage attachment to slavery. Second, Augustine does not offer a hope for the perfectibility of humanity as a whole, nor does he offer a guarantee of humanity's prof aggressive moral improvement, much less that of the secular state. He would not, in a word, subscribe to the optimism of the Whig view of history. On the contrary, he would probably criticize its naivete in words akin to Theodore Adorno, the 20th century German, who said that progress simply means moving from the sling to the atom bomb. Nonetheless, however much the human race is implicated in some terrible aboriginal calamity, as Cardinal Newman says, still, for Augustine, moral improvement is surely evinced in individual persons through their own free cooperation with the divine assistance. Third, even when Christians are marginalized as their values are flaunted by the state, still Augustine confirms that they, we, can use the state's evil as a means of glorifying God. We can give courageous witness in the face of wrong. We can show forth love, the forgiveness of our enemies and the light of a better way. Doing so does not mean that we will be successful in worldly terms, but we have a guarantee of the gospel that that is not our goal. Fourth, 
Christians should realize that cultivating their faith through the church's life of grace will give them, us, a foothold here and now in the ultimate peace, which is our supernatural destiny. This is the peace that the world cannot give. But the state, for its part, in offering a worldly order and peace can provide the basic conditions by which we may congenially strive for the transcendent peace of the heavenly vision of God. Now, in light of Augustine's experience of the Christian subordinate to Rome, we might ask what he would make of Rawls's overlapping consensus. It seems to me that the great father of the West helps to make a better justification for aspects of Rawls's theory than Rawls does himself. On the one hand, we might argue that the overlapping consensus is based on what Augustine would see as a realistic view of what the liberal state can offer and provide, given its current subjection to the moral fracturing that is not foreseeably going to vanish. The overlapping consensus offers, in a word, peace and the means for basic order in the midst of wide diversity. On the other hand, it keeps the liberal state away from interfering in those normative claims by which we as individual moral agents, as Christians, govern our private and, in large part, our professional lives. The overlapping consensus thus enables us to practice virtue in our own sphere of influence, even as Rawls himself contends. Yet for the Christian, these virtues do not pertain merely to Rawls's concept of civic piety, but to the gospel's proclamation of the kingdom precisely as we exercise these virtues in light of our supernatural destiny. In short, the state, by respecting our convictions about the priority, our convictions about the priority of the good over the right, guarantees a stable tranquility to aid us in aiming for the heavenly city where God, as St. Paul prophesies, will be all in all. But what might Augustine make of Sandel's criticism that the overlapping consensus is incoherent because, the public, because public discourse will not reach a consensus about the right without inquiring into the good, which it demands must be bracketed? Well, Sandel ha himself has doubts about the force of his criticism. While it may be possible, he says, for public discourse to reason about the universality of the good, when our moral, philosophical, and religious views are unbracketed? Still, Sandel is not sanguine that any debate about the applicability of the universality of the good to abortion and same-sex marriage will reach a consensus. As a result, Sandel himself seems to recognize, finally, that at least for the purposes of civil debate, Rorty is likely right when he denies a God's I view of morality. To put the matter in Patrick Deneen's terms, a universal notion of the good without a uniform Christian society as liberalism's seedbed is contradictory. Augustine, as a result, would likely remind Christians that the liberal state cannot come to a consensus about the good and the true precisely because of the original sin so naively misunderstood by his own Pelagian nemeses. Let us remember original sin. It is the bedrock of the Christian faith. It so darkens our natural reason and weakens our will that achieving a consensus about the good and the true in the secular arena outside of grace defies probability. As Newman similarly observed, to look into this busy, living world, one is often stymied to see no reflection of our creator. In fact, says Newman, human reason's suicidal excesses present us with a vision too dizzy 
and a Paul. It is only through God's revelation that the undue freedom of thought arising from the immense energy of the aggressive intellect is ultimately directed to the authentic good and true, however rational nonetheless the fundamental premises of the natural law may be. In short, without grace, reason struggles to see its own object clearly. And what might Augustine make of Schindler's criticism that the liberal state imposes a dictatorship on civil society when it enforces its own implicit notion of the good in order to guarantee certain individual rights deemed immoral by Christians? As the great doctor says, and I quote, for as far as this life of mortals is concerned, which is spent and ended in a few days. What does it matter under whose government a dying man lives if they who govern do not force him to impiety and iniquity? End quote. But what if the state should so force us? St. Thomas affirms that an unjust law of the state is not a binding law. Should the state compel us to do what is evil, we would have no choice but to refuse and suffer the consequences. But would being so forced mean that we should then, therefore, withdraw completely our cooperation from the state or even seek to alter or replace it by some non ironic means? Great reluctance to do this should be our instinct as Edmund Burke, a disciple of Augustine's on this point, warns, lest, as in the French experience, the meticulously constructed continuity of institutions that order the complex interrelations of human community be summarily devastated, leaving us defenseless prey to the unrestrained barbarism of our own nature and that of others. In conclusion, changing my tone a bit, I would like to make a suggestion, even though none is here, to the American bishops of the United States, aware that under their great ages operates a vast array of parishes, schools, colleges and universities, social service networks, hospitals, and the means of public relations and publication, and also aware that because of these, the American church enjoys enormous potential to influence public discourse. I would suggest that the bishops, united as a body and working in and through the structures of their dioceses, undertake a national program in educating Catholics in the natural law, in what it is, in what it teaches, and in why the church uses it as the ground and basis of morality. Were such a project pursued with skill, aplomb, and determination, it could well be that the natural law as determining the universal good could exercise a powerful sway in public debate, so much so that we might even hope that just as Rawls eclipsed utilitarianism, so the natural law would eclipse the monadic self as the source of its own ends. I think it, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, thank you. I mean, first of all, uh, the principle of subsidiarity is, a, is an absolute bedrock of Catholic social thought, as Pat Patrick brings that out. And uh, if I understand uh, Tocqueville's argument uh, in his 1840 book, it, it's ironic because uh, America in 1840 was anything but a Catholic country, and yet, uh, the principle of subsidiarity was, was well lodged 
within America at that time. Probably uh, not due, of course, to the fact that Catholicism brought it, but due to the fact that uh, this is evidence for its being part and parcel of the rationality of the natural law. Um, yes, uh, I think Patrick is certainly right that it's, that it's under great pressure. So as to your more precise question, would, would, would my proposal that the American bishops engage in a national program, would that, would that violate uh, the principle of subsidiarity? Um, I don't think so, because this is a principle, as I say, that is carried in the very heart of the Christian message. And, and Christianity is, if you will, a, a global, universal uh, faith, religion. And so therefore, uh, it's good that the, the church, you know, preach the message universally, but to preach it universally, of course, means that it's also going to be preached locally. And uh, you could work out, it seems to me, you could work out ways in which uh, at particular diocesan levels and in particular schools, particular institutions, instruction in the natural law were given so that there would be lo local control over this. I, a good friend of mine, a Jesuit confrere of Paul's, actually of Paul's and mine, uh, Peter, Father Peter Ryan, was recently the American bishop's advisor on doctrine. And at a Christmas dinner uh, with mutual friends of ours, after he had had, after he had had one or two glasses of red wine more than I had had, and he was <laughs> rendered benevolent, I endeavored to say to him, you're in a position to do something about this. What is more important than the natural law, particularly because the natural law is that place where, you know, Christianity meets uh, the secular world because the natural law, it's, it's where Christian reason meets secular reason. So there's, there's a bridge there. There's a fruitful place for apologetic engagement and dialogue. Can't you, uh, can't you do something to persuade the bishops that this is a, a very good idea, uh, particularly at this time in our country when we have so many of these issues that we've just been talking about? Um, he looked directly at me straight in the eye and uh, he said, I don't think that would get anywhere. Uh, he said, the bishops are very divided about, about this and I don't think we could persuade them to get on board a project like that. So that's uh, perhaps, even if I have a good idea, it's probably not practical. I've thought a little bit about it. Uh, I think what you would have to, what you would have to, what the bishops would have to decide is, uh, they would have to decide where they come down on how they interpret the natural law. They would have to decide on a version. Are they going to take, you know, the Finnish Grise version, which has sometimes been called lightly baptized Kantianism? Or are they going to uh, take something like uh, the way that the, the Summa Theologiae lays it out in uh, Prima Secundae uh, question uh, 94, I think, which preserves a viable role for, uh, for God in the natural law, which God is, uh, unfortunately, I, I know what De Finis and Grise are up to. They're very much concerned about the is ought distinction. So they uh, want to put together uh, a consideration of practical reason without any speculative uh, ingredient. But the, uh, the problem with that is that God somehow gets lost in, in the mix. So I think the bishops, are they would first have to decide what version of the natural law they would want to put forth. I would certainly stand by what, what Aquinas says. And, and Aquinas's view of the natural law, as you know, is th this is not this is not the straw man that many people dismiss when they speak about the natural law, kind of reasoning down to the uh, 
the most contingent uh, of moral situations and declaring those to be infallible. This is certainly not Aquinas' take on it. So, I mean, this would have to be a very considered and sustained project where they would just have to decide what interpretation to use and how to go about how to go about uh, teaching it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that you know, like it or not, uh, given given uh, as you say, given the problems with with natural law, given the fact that the natural law is not universally self-evident, uh, still, we can't escape the fact that Catholicism has, does, use it as the very basis for its morality and ethics. So if nothing else, uh, it would be an, a, an educational endeavor, you know, for, uh, for Catholics. And I would hope that in educating Catholics, as Augustine says, the the realm between uh, Catholics here uh, and the world is porous. Catholics go forth from the Catholic world, you know, in a kind of evangelical outreach to the world. I would hope that as we educate Catholics on this in some consistent and reasonable way, the word would percolate and filter into broader society. This is, that is a superb question, and you can see I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, passionate about it. If I could answer your question in one word, and I'm not using this word simply because I wrote a whole book on the subject. <laughs> the word is analogy, analogical. Your, your own man, uh, my former teacher when he was visiting professor at Yale, who's been professor here for many years, emeritus now, David Tracy, has written, written a book on the subject, The Analogical Imagination. Catholics have an analogical imagination, right? We are called to live analogically in a very mixed, complex, and divided world. What does analogy mean? What does the Protestant, excuse me, I don't mean to offend uh, Protestantism, and I'm going to make it, uh, my whole family on my father's side were all Protestants, so I don't mean to, uh, but there is a sense in which Protestant traditionally puts forth, Protestantism traditionally puts forth more an equivocal view between the world, uh, you know, and the kingdom. Catholics put forth, Catholicism has traditionally been much more balanced in its analogical view. And the analogical view means that we hold tensions in a healthy uh, mix. We're able to live with complexities. On the one hand, uh, we, are called, we are called to live in a world that is still fractured by original sin. Yet, in the very midst of the fracturing of original sin, as I say, the vestiges of God, even in a corrupt state, still are there. So, uh, we are called to face both, both of those things at the same time. At the same time, on the other hand, uh, as I say, what is the what is the goal and what is the end goal and purpose of a Christian? It's ultimately not to be happy in this world, it, right, Michael? Right. Am I right on that? That's the goal. Of huh? Christian. Sometimes yeah. I feel when I tell my students at Georgetown this, you know, they, they, they walk out, the, they're prepared to walk out the door. Our destiny is not here, and Augustine reminds us very strongly about that. Yet, at the same time, that should not lead us into some kind of vertical, vertical, verticalism whereby we only look up and don't look out. We are also called... Uh, Christ has also called us to serve our neighbor, and that in serving our neighbor, we uh, at the same time give witness to our love of God, right? Without love of neighbor, there can be no authentic love of God. So that's another analogical moment that we are called to live in. And what I, what I worry about is this, uh, is this whole uh, radical uh, 
either or notion that, that you talk about uh, as opposed to living analogically within these various tensions. I think that, that this is one of the things that Augustine in the City of God, I think, um, gr grasps most profoundly. Does that answer your that question? Is. Thank you. Analogy. My book is $65. <laughs> Catholic University of America Press. I've got it through in our library long already. Oh, okay. <laughs> That is, a, that is a very good question. Perhaps one way that it could play a role is to, uh, to have us examine, to draw attention to the presuppositions of those rights. In other words, oftentimes, uh, as, Jefferson, uh, as Jefferson noted, the idea that rights are given to us by God is something that with the, the evanescence, as they say, of religion is becoming less and less uh, credible. That people sort of instinctively are starting to believe that universal rights are given to us by the charters of the United Nations or by the, the Constitution or whatever. Um, and what follows from that, of course, is that if those rights are granted by charters and organizations, those organizations and charters can take them away. So what could be very helpful, it seems to me, is a sustained consideration of where these rights come from, why they call them universal. Uh, they come with human nature, but, but why? Why do they come with human nature? Because there is an author of human nature that has implanted these rights within our very nature. So I think that uh, could be very helpful. That's all we have time for today. Please join me in thanking Father Fuels. Thank you.